Good morning, St. Peter's by the Sea, and anybody who's tuning in to hear this message this Sunday. My name's Patrick, I'm the vicar at St. Peter's, and it's lovely to be with you. And this morning I'd love to share a message about the power of forgiveness and its importance in Jesus' kingdom. Is it me or is the world now much less tolerant than the one, well, I grew up in? When an idea takes root in the public psyche and establishes itself as the prevailing truth, woe betide you if you dare to express a contrary opinion. Be prepared to be unfollowed, called out or abused in the social media stratosphere. A recent example is uh, J.K. Rowling, the author of the Harry Potter books, taking issue with the automatic rights of men who transition to become women. Now, writing that sentence is a minefield. I, I really feel a, sh a shiver through my 200 Instagram followers. Now, whether J.K. Rowling is right in her views is not the point. The fallout in social media could not be more troubling. It seems to say, if you do not agree with my view of compassion, then you're not a compassionate person, so I can have nothing to do with you. Now, the two things that seem as rare as a good hair day for Donald Trump are curiosity and forgiveness. Curiosity about someone else's point of view and the understanding that forgiveness is the bedrock of all human relationships. Now, Jesus tells this parable that essays read to us, to his followers, to help them understand that forgiveness, even though it's super tough at times, well, you cannot really live without it. Now, I'm sure we can all think of times when we felt hurt and we found it hard to forgive someone. It's possible too, isn't it, that someone also has felt that about each of us as well, at some point, right? I remember some years ago, feeling really hurt when someone put me down verbally in front of some good friends. I don't think now that he knew how much his words hurt, but I felt wounded. And I shared this with a friend, Chris, who knew Jamal, from whom I felt this hurt. That was my first mistake. Jamal was a Christian teacher. And when Chris went to listen to him, he later told me all he could think about was how Jamal had hurt me. What had I done then? I just multiplied the offence. I said sorry to Chris. We prayed about it, the situation. The way I worked through this hurt, which might have seemed small to anybody else, was by praying for Jamal every time I had a shower until my resentment began to subside. I would pray blessing on Jamal. You know, it's really hard to stay mad at someone when you're going to keep praying blessing on them. Now, the reason I tell this story is that recently, Jamal got in touch with me after years of no contact. He was going, he has been going through a very difficult, painful time. And he felt that I might be able to offer him some support. That was such a powerful moment for me. I, I was deeply touched. I, I realised that the work of forgiveness had been done. It felt like God was saying, see that work which you allowed me to do in your heart. It was so important because now I need you to love Jamal in the way that I love you. And that would not be possible if you had not let that pain go in giving it to me. Funnily enough, I still remember how hard I found it to forgive Jamal. Yet I'm so privileged to support him today in a time of real suffering in his life. Now, in case you're wondering, I've changed his name for this message. But forgiveness can be very tough. Jesus says, nevertheless, it's not an option in his kingdom. It is non-negotiable. It's a deal breaker. Malcolm Gladwell, who wrote The Tipping Point and How Little Things Can Make a Big Difference, wrote about how witnessing someone else's forgiveness transformed his own life. 
he was researching for a book and he wrote, I went to see a woman in Winnipeg by the name of Wilma Dirksen. 30 years before her teenage daughter, Candace, had disappeared on our way home from school. The city had launched the largest manhunt in its history and after a week, Candace's body was found in a hut a quarter of a mile from the Dirksen's house. Her hands and feet had been bound. Wilma and her husband Cliff were called in to the local police station and told the news. Candace's funeral was the next day, followed by a news conference. Virtually every news outlet in the province was there because Candace's disappearance had gripped the city. How do you feel about whoever did this to Candace? A reporter asked the Dirksons. We would like to know who the person's person or persons are so we could share, hopefully, a love that seems to be missing in those people's lives, Cliff said. Wilma went next. Our main concern was to find Candace. We found her. She went on. I can't say at this point that I forgive this person, but the stress was on the phrase at this point. We have all done something dreadful in our lives, or felt the urge to. Gladwell writes, I, I wanted to know where the Dirksons found the strength to say those things. A sexual predator had kidnapped and murdered their daughter, and Cliff Dirksen could talk about sharing his love with the killer. And Wilma could stand up and say, we've all done something dreadful in our lives, or felt the urge to. Where did two people find the power to forgive in a moment like that? Then I met Wilma Dirksen. The Dirksons live in a small bungalow in a modest neighborhood not far from downtown Winnipeg. Wilma Dirksen and I sat in her backyard, writes Gladwell. I think some part of me expected her to be saintly or heroic, but she was neither. She spoke simply and quietly. She was a Mennonite, she explained. Her family, like many Mennonites, had come from Russia, where those of her faith had suffered terrible persecution before fleeing to Canada. And a Mennonite response to persecution was to take Jesus' teaching on forgiveness seriously. The whole Mennonite philosophy is that we forgive and move on, she said. It's not always been easy. It took more than 20 years for the police in Winnipeg to track down Candace's killer. In the beginning, Wilma's husband, Cliff, had been considered by some in the police to be a suspect. The weight of that suspicion fell heavily on the Dirksons. Wilma told me she had wrestled with her anger and her desire for retribution. They weren't heroes saints. But something in their tradition and faith made it possible for the Dirksons to do something heroic and saintly. When I told a friend of mine about the, uh, the Dirksons, he said, he sent me a quotation from 1 Samuel 16, 7. It so perfectly captured what I realised David and Goliath was about that it's now on the first page of the book. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature because I have not, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. If we're honest, we, we all struggle with forgiveness at some point. It may not be as great as the challenge facing the Dirksons, but the journey Will always take us to the cross, the cross of Jesus Christ. So, forgiveness. Why is it the heart of the gospel? What is it? What is it? And how do we do it? Jesus feels so strongly about forgiveness that he saves his toughest parables to deal with the subject. At the end of this parable, where a king uh, forgives a servant a huge debt, and that servant does not reciprocate, does not do um, in turn do likewise and become a forgiving person, but a vengeful one, what happens to him at the end? Well, not only is he thrown into prison, but he, he's also tortured until he pays back all he owes. Now, this is a bit shocking, isn't it? But Jesus ends by saying, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless, unless what? Unless you forgive your brother, your sister, your neighbour, your enemy, 
your friend from the heart. And Jesus is saying an unforgiving heart leads to eternal punishment. That sounds rough, doesn't it? Jesus is saying, look, if you do not forgive your brother or sister, your neighbour, again and again, Peter, because it's Peter who asked the question, right? Then that is a sign that you were never really open to my grace. You never really got it. And maybe a picture's better to illustrate this. Imagine two fruit trees, for example, two apple trees in an orchard, side by side. One's got apples on, one, no fruit at all. It's late summer, time for the, uh, for the harvest. This one, with the apples on, we say it's healthy. This one with, with no fruit, we'd say it's um, dying, diseased. Of course, it, it's not the fruit that gives life to the tree, but the fruit reveals that the tree has life. So Jesus is saying that, really, there's no better way to show that you have a relationship with God based on his grace than whether you can forgive. Sure, it sounds tough to say, throw him in prison. This one does not forgive. But it's an accurate picture, isn't it? After all, when you stay angry at someone, when you hold a grudge, when you refuse to forgive, it makes you so righteous. You feel so wronged, so self-pitying, so self-righteous, so proud. All these things, they show their face and Maybe you can't see them, but others can. And that's why forgiveness in community is a key to freedom. So you and I will bear all the marks um, of someone on their way to internal punishment when we don't forgive. And those attitudes reflect Satan more and more and Jesus less and less. After all, what is the gospel? The gospel of Jesus Christ. You have been forgiven an infinite debt. One you can never pay back. And every moment you are called, you're being called into infinite grace. If you truly believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, not just our version of it, but the actual truth said in the scriptures, and then you still hold a grudge, well, you're blocking the effect of the gospel running through you. The gospel is not a pond or a lake that stops and stagnates. It's a river that runs through you so it brings life to you and then through you to others. What is clear is that for Jesus, forgiveness, unconditional forgiveness, is a life or death situation. So, I wonder if you can see how forgiveness, forgiveness is at the heart of the gospel, at the heart of Jesus' kingdom. We just need to look up, don't we, to Jesus dying on the cross. Remember what you and I did to him, that he bled for our sins, uh, the sins that we're even still now committing. So forgiveness is at the heart of the message of Jesus Christ. Second word is forgiveness. <laughs> Jesus' is teaching is so brilliant. He tells exactly what it is in the story. Look with me in verse 27. And let's see what the king does. Verse 27. What is forgiveness? The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt, and let him go. The servant's, martyr, the servant's, ma um, servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt, and let him go. Three things. Took pity, or had compassion. Cancelled the debt, let him go. So if you're struggling with anger, here the parable tells you to have compassion like the king. To have pity, it's a kind of picture word that really means your heart goes out to them it says you imagine what it might like to be in their shoes you your heart in them so to speak so when someone's wronged you you choose to empathize with someone by doing the internal work of what you have in common for example that you you're both in need of forgiveness in the greater picture and if you still can't see that then your self-righteousness has blinded you your pride has put you in prison now your resentment is going to torture you. And that's what it does, doesn't it? Now, what your heart naturally wants to do is to point out how different you are, how much better you are than them, how little you have in common in their story. But in truth, you have so much in common, don't we, with the person we want to chastise. But in order to stay angry, one of the most common strategies we employ is to caricature them. Not to think of them in human and compassionate terms at all. We exaggerate 
are polarizing of them until someone is the caricature of the truth. Because if you think about their humanity with compassion, if you look into their face, you'll see their, you'll see your face more clearly. And then you find it hard to stay angry. For example, I love this. You can just imagine someone lie, lies to you and that they've hurt you and you're fuming. It's easy to think of them as a liar, to caricature them, strip them of their humanity where, when you, you know, which you judge people by. Someone says, why did they lie to you? I don't know. They're, they're such a liar, it's disgusting. Okay, really. How about you? Have you ever lied? Not to them. No, never. What, you've never told a lie? Oh, of course I've lied. So what made you lie? Oh yeah, well that, that's different. That, that, that's, that's, that's complicated. And we, we make excuses for ourselves. What you won't hear ever really is the grieved person say, well, yeah, I lied because I'm a liar. <laughs> Our lies, however small, make sense to ourselves. We excuse ourselves. What does he do next? He cancels the debt. He did the hard work of having compassion, identifying with the offender, then he cancels the debt. And that, that's really the heart of what it means to forgive. Someone might be challenged to hear what the Bible says, but the key here is the size of the servant's debt. It's shocking. Everyone listening would have think this is ridiculous. It's like a national debt, or when it looked as if all the banks were going to collapse in 2007. The king has the right to take all the servants' possessions, his children, his family, and all his resources to compensate for the debt, and even then they wouldn't. But what does he do? He pays the loss himself. He, he forgives him the debt by paying it off himself. That's the opposite of making them pay. You know, that expression, I made him pay, I'll make him pay. I make her pay. So when you forgive someone, Jesus is saying that you not only have compassion on them, but you you take the debt off them. You're, you're not looking to make, make them feel bad, to control them with your anger. You release them of the debt. I remember once being, going through a really low time. I was really struggling and I felt I'd been beaten up by some people. Um, psychologically and I really needed to get away and a friend rang me up and he said you you need to come away and with the boys let's go to the mountains and I said yeah I'd love to and I, I, I can't I couldn't afford it actually I, it was just not a good time I didn't really have the means and he said you're coming and he paid this friend just paid for the trip he paid for the mountains the ski pass the the train up the mountain, the ski lodge. He paid my debt. He paid. He paid the debt that would have been mine. He paid it for me. No questions asked. At his own cost. It's a bit like forgiveness. The self-righteous wants to keep playing the tapes and make the other person feel bad. He or she wants them to pay to be reminded to keep playing the tape like they do. But that is the rule. That's the road of death, isn't it? In the Bible, you choose to forgive before you feel it. You give it because you've been forgiven. Almost certainly things are... We've been forgiven things far worse. Different things we're holding against this person. But little by little, as you grant forgiveness, you begin to feel forgiveness, don't you? Third and finally... Let him go. Release him or release her. That's what the king does to the man, doesn't he? You know, it's interesting that the amount of money the, the servant has lost is so large that actually the whole of the kingdom is at risk. But the king still has compassion on him and he cancels this enormous debt. And maybe the king thought this was mismanagement. It wasn't corruption. He doesn't make assumptions that this person is worse than he thinks. He lets him go. And the next bit is so comic. It's absurd. And Jesus wants you to think it's absurd. The man goes out and grabs someone who owes him a tiny sum in comparison to the millions he owes. And he starts to choke him. Now that absurdity 
is how absurd Jesus says our unforgiveness is in the light of what we've been receiving from God if we truly believe that God has forgiven us. And really that's all I wanted to say. You know, Jesus on the cross, his heart went out, didn't it, to those who were punishing him for something he hadn't done. He forgives you and me again and again, doesn't he? He says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Don't those words apply to me and you too? He became, he was without sin, became sin that we might live unto righteousness. He became your sin in some deep way. He actually became the ugliest parts of you and me. For example, your unforgiveness and my unforgiveness. That's pretty ugly stuff. So that we might live a right way, like him. He paid for all that. He forgave you and me at the cost of his life and he's still doing it, forgiving us. Forgiving that we put him there. And we need to be melted by his beauty. We need to be melted by his compassion and the, the cost of his kingship, don't we? So there's a few thoughts about forgiveness this day, this Sunday. I hope something I've said will give you life and bring healing where you may be hurting and help you to forgive where maybe you're finding it hard because forgiveness can be very tough. Yet with Jesus' help, it's possible. Let me pray. Father, thank you for the forgiveness you offer us in Jesus. Help us to be like rivers of forgiveness. We receive and it flows through us to others. Help us not to harbour and to harden our hearts and harbour and forgiveness in them, but release, wash through them so that others might know that you're alive and that you're living in us and might know you too. Bring healing. Bring help to those who are struggling today. Let them turn to you, confident that you can make a way. In Jesus. Amen.